教授那个 f r e d i c h 啊，他的中文名字是那个贝瑞斯啊，贝瑞斯教授。那那个他的专长就是研究那个关于心理学，然后特别是唐居易的这个这个哲学。那马老师，我们要补充的一些那个介绍。可以，也许等一下，等啊，等一下，那我们先，先，要不然关于我们这个，好、嗯，我们这个演讲系列主要是中国人知道什么系列，中国人知道什么系,系列。今天第一场啊，我们很高兴，就是第一场邀请到贝老师来帮我们做这个这个心理学演讲啊，关于唐君玉这边的演讲。那这个这个是一整个，我们总共今年会办几场？还没有，还没有，就一直在推，现在开始，一直在现在开始。那这主要是中国所谓外文治疗中心的这个这个计划啊，支持的这个演讲系列。那希望以后各位同学都能够踊跃参加，不管是啊对中国哲学跟西藏哲学有兴趣的同学，希望能够支持这个西藏这个活动。那请马老师再补充一下吧。其实我们先请陈老师，这个作为中心主任，中心代表，你说几句，要不要？我不是中心主任，不过我确实会，然后你知道中心做的一些事情啊。我对事情的原因，应该还是在追溯我们的郑老师。我最近一期的资料是在我的名下计划添购的。呃，我都会获得六百万元，我们尽可能的补充了我们外文资料中心的信仰图书，不只是英文，德文、法文，甚至有意大利文啊。虽然还不算称为齐备，我希望每一年针对每一个作者最新的出版品都能够读出，还有最新的出版品。那这个资料中心希望从台湾到亚洲。乃至于变成世界级的呃中国哲学资料中心，那就是我们是一万呃一万多地。那现在最主要执行的力量来自于马海子老师了哈。那包括今天我们主讲者是马海子老师力邀的，所以我们该多给马老师一些掌声。谢谢。呃，好，那我也说几句，对我我也很高兴今天有，就是有有有有这样的机会。对，就是我们今天能够推动这样一个新的演讲系列。对，我们过去当然有办过很多关于海外中国哲学研究的演讲，对，但是我们就后来就是我我我与陈老师、李老师啊与其他同仁商量以后，就决定要推动一个新的学术演讲，对，就是提高我们这个中国哲学研究外，就是中国哲学研究中心，然后这个中国外文治疗中心的这个能见度，要加强。国内国外学者的互动，所以我们就特别设定了这样的一个学术演讲系列啊，就是我们今天就是算这个这个演讲系列的第一场。那我们很荣幸邀请到费教授，那、啊、亚当大学的,的这个托马斯·托利奇教授啊，我我想我不需要做很详细的介绍啊，如果你如果有兴趣，你可以上网的，在网在他的网站上找找到相关的资料。贝教授是瑞士人，所以说他本来是在居瑞士念念大学，他他所念的是汉学、政治学、国际法、国际法。那之后他转到基本上他他的研究兴趣，他的研究专长是这个当代中国与当代台湾的政治思想、政治哲学、政治思想史，所以他对这个新儒家当然颇感兴趣，特别是唐君。所以他对，但是就是他明年，他这个明年，要或者今年对吧？即将出版一本专书，英文专书，就是，对，明年就是，就是要要就是，专门在专门研究的唐君毅的哲学，特别是这个唐君毅的政治思想、历史哲学。那他昨天已经做了一一场演讲，在国家图书馆做了一场演讲，在很很详细的给我们介绍这个这个唐君毅的一个未来民主中国的这样。我们都知道，唐骏与与毛中山在在香港与与台湾活动很活跃，那他们并没有真的活在一个一个自由民主国家里，但是他们期待就是未来的中国可以可以发展成一个自由民主政体，可以推可以可以就是与与现代性与西方的这样一个现代性结合，或者就是构成一种一种。更更更更更更更更,更和谐或者更理性的一种现代模式啊，所以这个这个在我们在台湾对，就是我当然对这样一个问题会有感触啊。我们都知道啊，就昨天我们在讨论在讨论当中也出现了这样一个议题。我们都知道这个台湾在台湾这个自由民主的这个基础其实蛮蛮脆弱的
所以这个我我我想，呃，这个这个费教授的研究角度很有兴趣，很有意思，对，就是他不是并没有在只是在在继续继续怀旧，或者只是在在在品品调啊，或者继承这个新儒家，而是他用一个用一个批判性的哲学性的角度来重新检验新儒家，从唐军这样的贡献。对当代的这个中国政治思想的贡献，他们，嗯，他也他也出了啊，就讲蒋渭水的这个方面的研究著作，所以他很关心台湾啊这样的一个一个，这这样的一个一个就是一个一个一个一个台湾的处境，很关很关心台湾的处境，所以我很真的很高兴我们今天邀请到费教授，他他今天的演讲题目，他的演讲题目是。在这个讲义上，我们看到的是 Confucian optimism in the face of turmoil on Tangentese vision of history。就是，那所以我就想了想了一下，那我就也想，哎，最最适合当做评论人的，应该是我们东吴大学历史系的黄教授，黄道强教授。所以我很高兴，要能能够邀请到黄教授啊。黄教授的专场也很多啊，或者他的研究著作也非常多。我我在这里。我方面有时间很仔细介绍，那么啊，我你们可能也也知道，或者也也有的同学可能也修过黄教授的课啊，那他本来是好像在法国拿到一个关于张学成的博士，对不对？博士论文这些张学成，黄教授，黄教授，对对对对对。然后后来，对，就是最最最近出了一本专书，啊，专门谈探讨这个唐军义的历史哲学。所以说这两个这两位先生们啊，这两位先生都有的研究有一定的。就是有有交错的地方，所以我很期待两位专家的互动传递。然后，对，我想我们就我就不多说，我们就请费教授开始。然后，我想也许你可以用五十分钟的时间或者六十分钟的时间，先介绍一下，我先做一下你的演讲。然后，我们可以请黄教授做一个十五分钟的二十分钟的回回应。然后，我们再看看能不能就是就我们就是各位专家，各位。同学啊，能不能也来提问啊，来参加我们的讨论？谢谢。啊，请请飞的时候开始。很感谢今天飞到这里的表达，呃，这个演讲就是跟你们一起讨论一下，最近大概十年与唐军义的，主要是啊的政治哲学研究的一些结果，有很宝贵的机会，希望我们可以之后讨论。嗯、um, ，我的这个演讲我是先用英文呃讲，可是讨论之后可以用中文没问题，所以你们英文、中文、德文都这边问题就好了。嗯嗯，我希望你们都有那个很好的背景。那么 ，OK， 嗯、um, ，So as you can see, I will first um. So a few things about the biographical and historical context of Tang Chunyi. Then I will uh, briefly talk about uh, concepts of modernity and modernization, which, in a way, are in contrast to what I think is basically how Tang Chunyi envisioned modernity or the process of modernity. So the next step will be uh, I will introduce uh, Tang Chunyi's vision ideas about modernity and modernization. Um, since I believe that his uh, uh, ideas are basically uh, very optimistic, uh, I would say something about optimism of progress in Confucian thought, or maybe in Chinese thought of the uh, 20th uh, century. And finally, I would say something about uh, history as envisioned by Confucian thinkers and especially Tang Chunyi in general. So not only modernity, but the vision of history, what is history, what concept of history. And uh, then I will reach a brief conclusion. Um, I approach Tang Chunyi, yes, in a critical manner, but um, since I believe that if you want to honor somebody's uh, philosophical achievement, you need to criticize uh, that person's philosophical work to keep it alive. So uh, that's how I was, uh, I got my training in doing philosophy, and I think it's uh, so far still a very productive way. Maybe it could be perceived as typical Western, I don't know, but uh, my personal conviction is there is only philosophy and it's universal. And maybe there are different styles and types, but that depends also on the scholars and not necessarily on the nationalities. Okay, 
Um, as probably all know, uh, Tang Chuni uh, is usually labeled uh, uh, one of the most important representatives of modern Confucianism. Usually people say he belongs to a second generation of modern Confucianist thinkers together with people like Xu Fuguan, Mo Tung San, uh, Tang Chun Mai, which is somewhere between the first and the second generation. Um, I personally believe that it is highly problematical to talk about the uh, uh, modern Confucianism as a, uh, somehow as a unified group. I think the differences in between these people are so big that it's, it's really questionable. Uh, usually people would say, ah, uh, uh, Tang Chun was a, a disciple of uh, Xiong Shili. But actually, if you read into the text, there's so many contradictions. So I think it's better to, probably in the first step, to read these people's chief philosophical texts as if they were really produced in a very autonomous uh, manner. Um, yes, maybe to, uh, I will not say much about his biography. He was born in 1909 in uh, Sichuan province. So not in one of the big urban centers, but also not in a very uh, rural area, like for example, Chenru. Uh, uh, so a bit different background. Uh, yesterday, I uh, to shorten basically the biographical uh, introduction, I just made uh, a remark saying that he was born in 1909 that was still imperial China. About 60 years later, when in Hong Kong, he watched a documentary movie about the Woodstock mm -hmm. concert in the United States. And he wrote about it, actually in a quite interesting manner, just to cover his lifespan. Born while uh, 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 the imper imperial China was still there and 60 years later writing about Woodstock. So I think maybe it gives one an image of this, basically the development his lifespan covered is enormous and really hard to imagine. So what, is, uh, what did these people of this generation of modern Confucianists actually uh, personally experience in terms of historical or political development? I think quite a lot. First, when they were still very young, they uh, were still alive when the Republican governments all failed after 1912 and this warlord period basically destroyed many hopes for a functioning democracy uh, in China. Um, in the 1920s, there were teenagers back then, they witnessed the establishment of a one-party government uh, eventually in the second half of the 20s by the Kuomintang. Um, when the Japanese aggression started on the Chinese mainland and eventually led to the outbreak of World War II in 1937, uh, people like Tang Chun Yi, they were in their mid-twenties to early thirties, so obviously very well aware of what was happening in, in China back then. Um, finally, they witnessed after uh, the end of World War II the Civil War. Uh, you could argue another failure of constitutional government uh, in China. Impossible to reconcile the two struggling parties. And uh, finally, uh, they had to take crucial decisions, staying on the mainland or going to exile. Hang Chun, as you all know, of course, chose exile. He went to Hong Kong. He was about age 40 back then. About like five, six years younger than I would be today, so basically in the middle of his life. Um, so it's obvious, uh, uh, even after the period in exile, uh, the turmoil that these people witnessed in land. Uh, living in Hong Kong, they were very close to the mainland, so the impact of uh, developments on the mainland was felt immediately. Uh, a great leap forward, uh, cultural revolution, but also the authoritarianism in Taiwan. Tang Chun traveled several times in the 50s and 60s to Taiwan, even in the 70s, uh, met uh, with Jiang Chie Shi, Jiang Qingguo, uh, remained skeptical in, to some degree, as we know from letters to his wife, where he was saying like the economic and military development of the Republic of China on Taiwan was impressive, saying nothing about the political development. It's quite obvious to silence him that. So um, also witnessing Cold War tensions, or in the Korean Peninsula, so arguably they faced a very bleak uh, picture of China's modernity. Uh, the picture doesn't get much better when we think about how they uh, uh, saw Confucianism's fate in the 20th century. 
Um, first, we have the dissolution of the state cult, the imperial state cult in 1912. So Confucianism, at the latest back then, got completely detached from political institutions. And any attempt to reattach it uh, proved to be utterly unsuccessful. The, these attempts to introduce uh, things like Hong Jiao, a Confucian state religion, failed. Um, eventually, we had this widespread criticism of Confucianism in the May 4th period, or Xin Wen Huan Yun Dong, which at the time, especially in the beginning, got quite radical. Basically saying that Confucianism in general was rather unfit for a modern society. We have dogmatic uh, distortions of Confucianism under the uh, regime of the KMT, which made obvious use of Confucian values to implement a uh, not exactly democratic form of government, and that was also perceived by people like Tan Junior, I would argue quite clearly. Um, they also witnessed the dismantlement of Confucianism in the People's Republic of China, which began um, definitely in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, when research on Confucianism on the mainland uh, got more and more uh, uh, ideologically um, questionable. Actually, by in the early 50s, Tang Chunyi was still invited to come back to the mainland by Yang Chun. And finally, also quite important for the vision uh, these people had about the fate of Confucianism in the 20th century, 20th century are Western misconceptions of Chinese culture in general and Confucianism in particular. That was also a big topic for uh, their reflection. Okay, so I move now to the second point, uh, which would be concepts of modernity, because at this point we might actually expect that uh, thinkers who have such a historical and biographical environment might be quite pessimistic about modernity. It's not exactly a nice encounter they personally had with uh, history in the 20th century. So you could think that they might think about modernity as a violent process with a lot of warfare, revolutions, civil wars, world wars. Uh, full of unforeseeable turn of events. Who could have known that uh, within a few months the imperial government would break down in 1911? Who could have known that uh, Yuan Zhikai would take power as a dictator only like two, three years after he was uh, elected president? And so on. So actually, you could argue a lot of historical contingency was visible in, in China's history and in world history. So we might expect that um, these people in thinking about modernity and history would say that contingency is a very important element, obviously, of the process of modernity. We also might expect that they would say it's uh, typical for the experience of modernity that change is happening ever quicker, acceleration of change, and an obvious loss of orientation uh, dismantlement of traditional values and life forms and customs. So you might in some expect that they would more or less have a quite a negative, uh, pessimistic picture of modernity. It would then be maybe a picture like the one uh, Max Weber, German sociologist, developed. Uh, very pessimistic. Or maybe they would envision history like the German philosopher and literary critic Bata Benjamin. Max Weber, as you might know, uh, developed this uh, image of modernity as an iron cage of dependence. I think you have these keywords on, on your handout. That's a depiction of modernity, of Western capitalist modernity, um, which is in a way a disempowerment of human agency. So human individuals, but also collectivities, are quite powerless vis-a-vis uh, -vis the process of modernity. Because the process of modernity for Weber is basically characterized by um, a bureaucratic state and a capitalist economic uh, order. And these two together were extremely strong forces, but anonymous structural 
resources, which could not submit it to good ideas and uh, collective will. So basically the individual will or even the collectivities are totally frustrated when they try to steer modernity in a certain direction because the structural dynamics were so strong they overpowered for the more or less uh, human agency. Weber was also talking of modernity uh, in, in other metaphors, uh, saying it is a polar night of icy darkness. So it's not exactly a cozy place to be. And Weber would maybe admit that people might, uh, in the evenings when they endure the cruelty of life in a modern, bureaucratic, anonymous, rational, instrumental, everyday life, that they might in the evenings maybe engage in some spiritual exercises to recover a bit, but basically there's no escape. Once stuck in modernity, this process is just taking place and cannot, fully, cannot be ever again fully controlled. Uh, quite similar, if you will, uh, about the Benini, uh, who had to flee from the persecution by the Nazi government and finally uh, committed suicide in 1940. And it's exactly that year when he published Thesis on the Philosophy of History. And he reflected there on a famous small painting by the Paul Klee, famous painter, and the title of this painting is Angelus Novus. It's an allegory for human history. The painting shows basically an angel uh, who is uh, um, flying, but the, there is a storm blowing, and the wind got in his wings and he's turned around, so he's basically flying backwards. He cannot control um, which direction he's taking, and he doesn't see where he's going, he cannot see in the future. And all the angel sees is basically a big heap of destruction, destroyed buildings, a landscape of utter destruction. And for Benjamin, basically, that wind, he was also a mystical religious thing, because that's the wind blowing from paradise, a storm it is, and uh, this storm is progress. So progress in modernity, or the course of modernity, is destructive. And not even the angel of history can predict what's coming, and he cannot also turn around and decide which direction he wants to fly. So that's a very strong picture again that human agency basically is completely empowered in the process of it. So, uh, it is quite uh, um, astonishing, maybe, that Confucian thinkers like Tan Chuni, having this historic experience, which is basically quite negative, uh, did exactly not develop pessimistic visions of modernity in history as what uh, Bartol Benjamin or Max Weber would. They were actually very optimistic. And that's the topic, basically, I want to get a bit deeper uh, into it now. Um, so I move now to the third topic, concepts of modernity and modernization in the thought of Tang Chi. Um, Tang Chi talked about modernity and the modern world in many, many different texts, starting in the 50s and 60s. So I'll, I'll just give a brief overview, um, very short. I would say he's basically developed um, um, a description of modernity which is to some degree quite mainstream in philosophical and sociological research because he uh, clearly saw that modernity is a dual process. It has a positive side but it has also a downside. The positive side would obviously be the emancipation of individuals from religious and traditional restraints. So basically if you're with the the project of enlightenment as the good side of modernity and he clearly perceived that also as a positive aspect of modernity. But he also saw negative sides like uh, social isolation of individuals, dissolution of communal ties, disintegration of shared social and political values, um, the forceful nature of an instrumental modernity the danger that uh, the human being would be reified utterly in modern instrumental processes of economy, 
And so he reached some conclusions saying things like, I quote him in a, that's basically even an English paper he delivered in the mid-60s on conference on modernization and so on, saying that um, what people encounter in the modern industrialized community was a new slavery in the modern social and political systems, saying that freedom and equality actually existed only in name, but had no substance. So in this sense, you could say a pessimistic diagnosis to some degree. But I still hold that he's utterly optimistic and compared to Max Weber, maybe exactly because whereas Weber would say modernity and modernization is characterized by inevitability, you cannot just change it according to your own wishes and will, even if you stand together as a society, you cannot overpower these processes and these dynamics. Tanchi would basically say, but yes, uh, it is possible to do so. We can steer modernity in a certain direction which is better than what we see in Western countries. So I would say he differed fundamentally from Weber's diagnosis of an administered society, Xinjiang China. How to overcome the threat of modernity? Uh, according to Tang Chunyi, it is possible to overcome it, but it is necessary to identify spiritual, normative inputs, motivational inputs, which can basically curb or control instrumental reason. And instrumental reason is basically being the reason developed out of economic necessities. So it is possible if a society would have gained a consciousness of its own historical, spiritual, cultural, ethical foundations to create a warmer, better, maybe softer form of modernity while not letting completely go of industrialization, uh, scientific, technical, technological process and so on. So I think it's really justified to call the vision function we had about modernity, not only him, I would argue, basically every thinker of modern Confucianism, call this a form of a project. A project which really has somebody who is doing this project. Um, one specific, uh, maybe, characteristic, yes, of, of this idea of modernization in China is obviously the idea that it is possible to catch up. The West, Western countries, at least some of them, seem to be ahead, Japan as well, in some areas like economic, military development, maybe country, but also argue political uh, development because what he wanted was a liberal democracy for China. But they were convinced you can't catch up in history. So in a way, history repeats itself because if you catch up, you, you're thinking on a matrix of things repeating itself, unless catching up makes no, absolutely no sense. The same is true for this often heard phrase of learning from the West, learning from mistakes or from achievements, but learn, learning means that you repeat experience done by somebody else. So there we already have a fundamental assumption on the process of modernity and history. If you think in terms of catching up and learning, seemingly there is an idea of uh, uh, repetition and controllability because learning means you have a subject you know, it can be an individual or it can be a collectivity or a nation, whatever but obviously somebody is able to learn from someone and that would be for people like Chang Chun Chun probably more or less the Chinese cultural nation would be able to study western achievements and make choices between uh, good and bad things and then try to create something uh, superior or desire. Uh, apart from that, Tang Chunyi was um, sure that modernization was a global process, a unified process. It had different uh, ways of manifesting itself in different cultures, but eventually it would lead to uh, a few things in common, uh, among them the liberal democracy. The a uh, scientific, te technologically advanced society, an industrialized society, and an open society. These were for him assets of the process of modernization, which would eventually take 
place on a global scale. Um, Organization for him was not completed, not even in Western countries. It was globally an ongoing process. So this is, I think, is also quite quite important to keep in mind. And of course, to steer this process, uh, institutional safeguards are important. It's not enough that just people have the right will to do and what is right. They need institutional safeguards. So they need constitutional government, liberal democracy, and they need, especially, a modern nation state. Um, maybe not so surprisingly, but still could be a bit disturbing, if you will, that thinkers like Tang Chini on the one hand had this global vision developed in the 50s and 60s, taking in basically world history. But if you read through these texts, you, you see they're almost oblivious of the danger of final collapse of civilization, which actually had occurred in the Second World War. So interestingly enough, and this is something I still try to make sense of, you have on the one hand a very severe criticism of uh, Western modernity, but not a, almost no word about the Holocaust. And the Holocaust basically would, could be uh, interpreted as the final collapse of a Western-style scientific economic project of enlightenment, leading to factories of death. Interestingly enough, as far as I can tell, none of these modern Confucian thinkers, although they had this explicitly global perspective, were taking in uh, uh, these challenges. Uh, Tang Chuni didn't do it, as far as I can tell. I haven't found anything in Xu Fuban's text about it, but maybe somebody here could tell me where we actually have real reflection on, on what had happened uh, uh, during the Second World War uh, under Nazi Germany's regime. Uh, I couldn't come up with anything. And also interestingly enough, even the Japanese aggress aggression, which is maybe on a different scale than the Holocaust, but is still a type of uh, aggression which was done with scientific and technological means and done by the most modern nation back then of East Asia, wasn't taken in as seemingly a very dangerous side of the No, they, to the contrary, Tang Chun is traveling in the 1950s to Japan and having an extremely positive vision of Japan, being basically the expression of uh, China's traditional culture in a modern form. I find that to some degree a bit disturbing. My take is, is that for somebody who has a fundamental optimistic vision of history, it is very difficult to take in things like the Holocaust and still stay optimistic. But that, that is only guessing because so far we simply do not have enough research on how Holocaust was actually perceived by Chinese intellectuals in the 50s and 60s. I move now to the fourth point and uh, go a bit deeper into this idea of optimism of progress and Confucian thought. I think it's not a Confucian invention. We have many, many other um, uh, manifestations of highly optimistic attitudes to progress uh, in Chinese intellectual history of the late 19th and 20th century. In order to take a closer look at the sort of historical optimism that seems to be prevalent in modern Chinese thought, it will be necessary to include in the Chinese context an influential thinker who did not belong, I would argue, to the ranks of modern Confucianism, and this is uh, Yen Fu. Yen Fu laid a groundwork for optimistic notions of modernizations in the late 19th century in China. This optimism of progress insisted on the crucial role of human agency in history. According to Yen Fu's scientific, social, Darwinist belief, the process of uh, history was overall controllable by human agency. Yen Fu wrote a series of articles immediately after the defeat of the Qing Empire against the Japanese Empire in 1895, uh, among them texts like uh, Yuan Qiang, this text published in Tianqi newspaper. There he presented his readers with new ideas about China's progressive development to become a modern and strong nation state. Fukuo Chang gave his famous formulas used. Yen Fu was convinced that although there were, was currently a backlog in modernization affecting China, including its deficits in nation building, 
there was still time for catching up with modern nation states. Obviously, this type of optimism of progress conceptualizes the process of modernity neither as a historical fate nor as a process which at best can only be in part controlled by human agency. In fact, uh, Western modernity or Chinese modernity maybe for that matter is rather perceived as a historical process which can be reproduced in China. Again, we have this topic as learning from the West, so catching up. Um, it is this optimistic outlook which accompanies, by the way, the discovery of something like world history in the Chinese reformist circles of the late 19th century. World history hasn't arrived in the mid, I would argue, mid 19th century in China. It pretty much arrived with people like Yen Fu in the late 19th century, the idea that there is actually something like world history. And it was actually arrived at the same, arrived at the same time as ideas about evolution, Darwinism, and progress. And interestingly enough, if you look into the Western intellectual history, uh, between the development of ideas of progress, as we usually today talk about progress, and the ideas of evolution, there were about three centuries in between. These ideas arrived simultaneously in China in the late 19th century, together with the idea of world history. So it's a very tense, quick reception of uh, very broad ideas with a uh, broad impact. Um, I would say that these optimistic notions of progress were particularly appealing to the type of consciousness of crisis that was current in mainstream intellectual and reform-minded circles in China since the late 19th century, but well into Republican China. Uh, within these circles, belief in uh, progress was matched uh, by a feeling of urgency stemming from the conviction that time was quickly running out for China to catch up with modern nation states. But even this sense of crisis still left room for the conviction that it was possible to guide the process of modernity so that China would be the sole master of its modern fate. I think this optimism of progress is not at all unique to China. You can find it also in Western contexts. Starting in the 17th, mostly in the 18th century, uh, well into the 19th century. Many expressions of highly optimistic ideas about history and progress in Western contexts. Obviously, Marxist's uh, philosophy of history is extremely uh, uh, optimistic because basically you know what's going to happen in history and you have a subject who's going to do it. Maybe the, uh, the working classes on the guidance of the Communist Party and can create its own history. Um, but even idealist types of philosophies of history are, I would argue, fundamentally optimistic. Their optimism probably comes from the religious background. It's kind of an eschatological ideas being secularized into philosophical expressions of philosophies of history. That's probably not the case with the Chinese types of historical optimism because as far as I can tell, I cannot pin down a religious background which would have been in a way translated into philosophical ideas. Um, overall, maybe we could argue that uh, in the West, in the 20th century, most Western countries Overall, uh, pessimism about progress got stronger, starting probably in the late 19th century. Um, you all know George Orwell's 1984, Aldous Huxley, Great New World, and on and on and on. So many, many different ways of expressing doubts, fear of progress. In, in literature, uh, science, fi science fiction literature, in philosophy, nowadays even in movies, of course. Um, still, we have also periods of um, um, optimistic outlooks on history in Western countries in the 20th century. Uh, one person who does research on these topics is Nicholas Rescher, you also have him on the handout, with this book, Predicting the Future, an introduction to the theory of forecasting, published in 1998. Uh, Rachel is talking about a period of, in the United States of 1945 to 1960, 
and where he says that's a kind of period of technological optimism. Of course, we have economic reconstruction in the United States, uh, similar to maybe uh, in scale to what happened in Germany in the post-war period. And Russia introduces there a term which I would say is quite apt to describe this attitude towards progress that's what we might call prospect optimism. Yuqi, not one to me, maybe it would be a possible translation. Um, now, what is important for this attitude of uh, prospect optimism? First of all, people would expect that the condition of things, as Russia says, the condition of things is movable towards the good. But this is not just happening, there is a we who can do it. So again, strong accent, uh, strong emphasis on uh, human agency. Also maybe important for us in this context is uh, the observation that uh, optimism of progress is not bound to a specific ideology. You find it in Marxism, you can find it in liberal thought, you can find it in uh, German idealism and in many, many other things. But technocracy is also a hyper-optimistic uh, uh, set of ide uh, ideology. So it's not bound to a specific ideology and maybe that's even the main reason why it is so persistent. Because it can basically express itself in current sets of ideas and change again. So it's, it's kind of a very persistent idea. Talking about um, optimism in the Chinese context, you have to mention Thomas Metzger. Maybe you read his or know his book entitled A Cloud uh, Across the Pacific. Was good. Yeah. I do also have it on the handout. I don't know if there is even maybe a translation of this book or not. Anyway, <clears throat> Thomas Metzger identifies, uh, and he's also, by the way, talking about Tang Juni. Uh, he identifies uh, with something, uh, uh, an attitude he calls epistemological optimism. Mm -hmm. mm, I think it is an interesting starting point he has, but he takes it much too far. Uh, if you read through his, his text about uh, uh, epistemological optimism, at some point you get the impression that basically the whole range of Chinese thought was always optimistic and it was always a type of this epistemological optimism. Now what does, what does epistemological optimism actually uh, mean? Um, what, Metz, uh, what Metzger basically ex uh, wants to explain uh, by it is the idea that um, it is an epi epistemological idea, an idea that there is something like an ultimate reality, a belief that there is an ultimate reality, it's not constructed by language, but it's an ontological entity, and that this ultimate reality can actually be directly described or perceived. Now this could be done in many different ways, uh, Metzger would probably rightly argue that thinkers like Tang Chun would say, yes, we can perceive it, but not in language, but we have a kind of intuition. But we have an access to an ultimate reality. I think that in itself is, is correct. What say I have a problem with him taking this even to multiple. Um, for him, it's, it's collapsing. So, so mean Li Xue, um, but even Xian Xin Ru Xue, Tao Chao Zixia, Xin Ru Jia, it's all epistemological optimism. I think that's a really, really big problem. I can maybe just briefly highlight that if you compare uh, Mao Zedong and Tang Chini. I mean, it's maybe even absurd to compare that. But then again, maybe we can discuss this later. Uh, obviously, when you think in terms of Mao Zedong, you have a totalitarian uh, um, current. You could argue that um, optimism of progress in core has something totalitarian. Because it's obvious, if you think also in Western, uh, uh, in the Western context in the 20th century, uh, Stalinism and National Socialism in Germany actually were optimistic because they knew where history should lead to. They knew the goal. They identified the enemy of history and said, if we eliminate this enemy completely and radically, we can enter basically in paradise on Earth. So you could argue that optimism of progress even core is something quite dangerous. And so I think it's not absurd when Metzger's thinking about Mao Zedong. It's just a bit of a problem when he's actually somehow conflating Mao Zedong and Tang Chunyi. And I think one basic 
difference would be the following. Uh, while Mao Zedong uh, believed that probably there is an ultimate truth in history. And you can even describe this in a scientific way because that's historical materialism. You have a scientific means to describe the truth of history, its goal, its agencies, and so on. Um, and you can basically execute this goal with a collectivity. There are different ways to do it. In the Great Leap Forward, it would be more economic planning measures that failed. Then you would switch to the masses of the Cultural Revolution and apply cultural measures, measures to implement the goal of history and its truth. Uh, you cannot find uh, similar ideas in Tang Chunyi's vision of history. Tang Chunyi is optimistical, again, when he thinks in terms of, of an individual grasping the ultimate truth, the absolute, in, a, in an act of intuition, definitely. But this doesn't translate to collectivities. And I would argue it cannot. Uh, and simply for the reason that the way for Tang Chunyi an individual is seeing the absolute truth, of existence and the universe is something like Yang Chi or Yi Zhong Jue Wu, Ti Hui, Zhi Jue, many different uh, uh, expressions he's using. And this is happening momentarily. Yang Chi has no language. You don't think. Basically, you simply perceive and do. So, this is, in a way, Zhi Xing He Yi. It's really a moment of awakening or enlightenment. But you're not thinking in terms of language when you grasp the ultimate truth in a way that Yang Chi would Yang Chi describe. So how can you translate this in a collectivity? This would mean that in the same instance we are all Shengren and just do the same thing. But the moment we start discussing, it's obviously we don't have intuition. Because intuition doesn't talk. It's just knowing it's right and doing it. We certainly know that uh, example from monks when somebody is going to a well, sees a child who is about to fall into the well and has this impulse, this urge to, to save the child. When monks monk tries to explain what are these situations. In the moment you have this urge to save the child, uh, monks is quite precise to say this, you don't think. You're not calculating saying, I saved this child now so the people in the village will maybe give me some money or uh, admire me or whatever. Or you don't even think that I'm a human being, this is a little child, I should save it. No, you don't do nothing. You just have this urge in, in a moment. This is without language. So I would argue you cannot translate this on the, on the, on the level of collectivity. Right? So while somebody like Mao Zedong could argue that it is possible to uh, incite uh, enthusiasm of the masses to such a degree that they implement the truth of history immediately because they understand the fundamental truth by applying historical materialism. You could not stand in front of the mass and say, now please everybody, Yang Chi, Yi Xia, and uh, then we implement the truth. <laughs> and Metzger doesn't make this distinction. I think that's quite fatal. So. Okay. So I was already talking a bit about this uh, form of implementation uh, or non-implementation of uh, a community of sages, Shengren. I mean, we have a very different idea of what a Shengren is, or obviously, in Chinese intellectual history. Um, so I I'm, would never give a, an overall definition of what a Shengren means. It's impossible. I would argue that when Tang Chunyi is talking about the Shengren, he exactly has in mind this single moment of intuition. He does not have in mind a very uh, necessarily somebody who is very virtuous in everyday behavior. This is also okay for him, of course. That's an important form of practicing Joshin or Kung Fu, trying to be a virtuous moral person. But that doesn't mean that you're a Shengren. A Shengren can never fail. Liang Chi is never wrong. If you're wrong, then you don't have Liang Chi. If you have Liang Chi, it's always right. And you always act, and you never talk. So, in a way, you could argue that this figure of the Shengren is half in historical reality. Because um, we learn by reading these texts, if you want to believe that what uh, people like Tang Chi are writing, it's seemingly in principle possible to achieve. It is possible to. Uh, to uh, 
conduct some way of self-cultivation and Kung Fu Xiuxian, many ways to continue to uh, uh, Dao the Fan Qing, Dao the Shi Jian, and it's a very ma many forms of trying to get close to intuition. So it is possible to achieve it, but you cannot stay in this state, because eventually you have to act in a society, you have to talk, and you fall back into language, into reflective thinking, into analysis, and that this is all exactly not intuition. So in a way, the Shangren is a figure which is half in history, and half in, in this ultimate reality. It's a borderline figure. I would say it's a limit concept. And I think the country is pretty clear about it. I think that makes this uh, philosophy, I would personally not follow that, I can say that this much, but I think it's a very uh, um, illuminating distinction he's doing here because by doing so, he has some kind of a firewall against authoritarianism. Because you cannot have a government telling its people we are Shenzhen and you are morally just behind us. It's impossible because that would mean they have permanent intuition, nobody knows. Um, so this idea of Shenzhen, I would say, is again, is kind of a limit concept. And that makes uh, him also taking in a transcendental vision. So I think his, his type of optimism is totally different from what Max Weber, who's writing about Confucianism, as you probably also all know. He was talking, uh, Max Weber was analyzing Confucianism and said there is a radical world optimism. In, Confucian, uh, in the Confucian mind. Uh, which for Weber basically meant that the Confucian mind is inclined to accept the world just as it is. You never fundamentally uh, would negate the world as it is because you have no transcendent realm where you could link yourself to and say this world is all wrong and I know it is wrong because I have some kind of in inner connection to a realm beyond which tells me this is not right. Babel would argue Confucian person cannot do this because it's always just in trying to muddle through the world. And I would say Weber, uh, which I well, whom I admire very much is totally wrong here. This is really a, a, probably also due to his limited knowledge, uh, obviously, of Confucian texts. But it, it would definitely not describe the type of optimism we find in modern Confucianism. It's not this kind of disworldly uh, uh, world optimism. It, it has a connection to something beyond, but it's still optimism. So, now turning maybe uh, to some ideas about this historical vision and I'm, I'm very happy to have Professor Wang uh, uh, to my side because in his seminal study, and he has it here, on the historical thought of uh, Tang Chuni, titled um, Learning and Statecraft, the Philosophy of History and Ultimate Concerns of Tang Chuni, uh, Professor Wang identified also an optimistic spirit, Le Guan, King Shen, in Tang Chuni's speculation about history. Uh, after reading uh, Tang Chuni and publishing articles on his political ideas for uh, about 10 years now, I'm really very grateful to Professor Huang to deliver this book uh, because there was very little research on the conceptions of history in Tang Chuni's philosophy. So, far. so now it will be easier for us in the future to continue doing research in this direction because we have the seminal study here now and maybe can also easier focus on some specific aspects. And that's exactly what I want to do. Um, according to Professor Huang's analysis, maybe it's not correct me, but that's how I understood him, uh, Tang Chuni was deeply convinced that there is something like a moral spirit of humanity which exists. And it's almost like an ontological entity. Yeah. And uh, Tang Chuni seemingly was convinced that this moral spirit, if it was enacted in the world, could overcome obstacles in history and fulfill itself in human history. Um, so this moral spirit is something like a drive, driving force in history. And it infuses the course of history with something like necessity. That's a very difficult point, I believe. 
in philosophy of histories, you have long explanations why history has to take this course and not another course. Easily marks it. There, there is no way around it. It's, history will develop in this direction. Uh, it's not a fateful argument because uh, usually what, what uh, for example, um, the working class could do is accelerate the process of history. But what the Communist Party could do is accelerate the process to a communist society. But the process will take its course by necessity. And you also have the same idea of necessity in Hegel's philosophy of history. Hegel would just argue you cannot, you cannot forecast. You only look backwards. But then you can understand the coming of reason. Um, the question of necessity in these Confucian visions of history is very tricky because um, I agree with uh, Professor uh, 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 Huang that this moral spirit seemingly infuses history with necessity, but it's very hard to grasp like you write, what's the problem for? Is it a religious idea? Is it a metaphysical speculation? Is it a philosophical idea? It's very hard to grasp. Um, so in the following, I will now concentrate on Tang Chinese historical optimism. Uh, and I think, in, again, that this is quite typical for the historical vision of Confucian modern thinkers. So I move now to uh, uh, number five of my speak, vision of history. According to um, Tang Chini, this moral spirit, which is kind of a metaphysical entity, of course, can be manifested in the historical world by human agency, can be displayed by human agency. Although Tang Chuni insists that history is thus driven by a force which is morally good, he does not assume that the course of history and its goal could be predicted in detail. Many questions may be raised here, addressing to Tang Chuni's approach. How actually can we know that there is a driving force in history? How can we know that this force is a moral spirit? Do we simply have to believe him? Is there any kind of necessity for the moral spirit to manifest itself in history? Or could it just not manifest itself? Does the moral spirit manifest itself only when a human agency consciously and willfully aspires to do so? Or is it just manifesting itself anyway? And maybe we just don't know it. So basically like this kind of reason here. Some of these answers, some of the answers to these questions are very difficult to obtain. Uh, because Tang Chi does not explicitly tackle all of these issues. Although he labels his own speculation about history and philosophy of history, he's talking about Li Shi Zhe We cannot simply identify his historical thought as belonging to the tradition of philosophy of history stemming from German idealism. I would argue it's something between a philosophy of history and a kind of an anthropology which is there is tension, because usually in anthropological thought you have the insistence that there is a core which doesn't change in, in the human being, which is non-historical. So that contradicts somehow basically uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the vision of a philosophy of history which thinks that no, there is a historical change even of the human being and of the human being. Uh, I think in Tang Chi to some degree you have both, and that makes it a bit somewhat difficult to actually pin down what, which direction is actually Because, as you know, we have this very strong uh, speculation about what human nature is, Confucius, obviously. I mentioned already monks. And the human being, uh, Tang Chini actually follows more or less monks or Wang Yangming in his idea about what, hum what human being is, or what human nature is. So you, you know this pas passage from the uh, uh, Mencius, I have it also on the handout in a, in a translation by D.C. Lau. Um, for a man to give, give full realization to his heart, qin qi xin, is for him to understand his own nature, zhi qi xin. And a man who knows his own nature will know heaven, zhi tian, can see the absolute. Adapted to Tang Chinese philosophy, this would more or less mean that the human being, if able to develop self-cultivation, Xiaoshan, Gong Fu, to its up, utmost utter point, successfully do it to, till the end, would be able to see 
or perceive the, he says, ultimate source of the universe and human life. Yu Zhou Ren Zheng Zhi Ben Yue. Congrats.